All right, so let's get to the game. Super Bowl 52. The Eagles and Foles shocked the NFL world with the upset win over the great New England Patriots, 41-33 in, Min- in Minneapolis. Um, Eagles quarterback Nick Foles plays the game of his life on the biggest stage, throwing for 373 and three touchdowns. Also can't forget his first career receiving touchdown in this game. Um, that being said, two of his touchdowns probably could have been called back after review. Um, first of all, the running back, uh, Corey Clement, touchdown, showed the ball move after the first step, and then his foot was out of bounds. Stoyo, did you see this touchdown, and did you think that this was uh, should have been incomplete? Nowadays, it's hard to tell what a catch is anymore, uh-huh. so I'm glad that the NFL is going to review that rule in the offseason, because it's... It's a 50-50 now. You just have to wait and see what the refs decide. I personally thought that this was not a touchdown, but I was very happy that they got called a touchdown because usually those calls go the New England's way. Yeah. And for once, it did not happen. So, yeah. Yeah, that was my exact thought, is that, you know, these usually go New England's way, and they're not. Um, the same same instance uh, that when tight end Zach Ertz caught the ball, and, uh, you know, his touchdown looked very similar to the Jesse James touchdown earlier in the year. The ball comes loose right at the end zone. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a bad rule, but I think that it probably should have been called incomplete by the rule. Um, Gavin, what do you think of these calls and uh, the touchdown calls um, in this game? Uh, I think if you t- NFL rules aside, I think that they were both catches. I think they both both players caught the ball um, and you know maintained enough possession for me to consider it a catch. Um, my I don't have an issue with the Ertz catch. I feel like he made more football move, more football move than uh, Jesse James, for instance, because he had two and a half steps about mm-hmm. between when he gained possession and then when he went to the ground. Um, and I've, you could even argue that it was the defender that forced Ertz to the ground after he had made one and a half, two steps, whatever it was. So, um, you know, just like a, a running back, once they've established possession. Um, if they get tackled and the ball hits the ground and that causes the ball to come out, um, it's not considered a fumble. They're down by contact. Yeah. Um, now, my issue with the Clement one, like I said, I consider it a catch personally, but my issue with it is that we've seen catches during this season where a very similar thing happens, and sometimes it's a touchdown and sometimes it's not a touchdown. Um, he, It looked to me like he was – he had possession and he was simply moving it to his other arm. It wasn't a bobble. I wouldn't categorize it as that, but um, I've seen enough instances where that is considered not possession to make this really questionable whether it was a catch or not um, as by the NFL standard. So that's uh, this is the issue that I've had all along is that you never really know. Uh, they say that there are these rules and, oh, well, it has to be these things. But um, this right here is an example where um, you have people, uh, you know, professional athletes, former athletes, um, Hall of Famers that are s- one saying it's a catch, the other saying that it's not. Um, so I think we have a there's a real issue here. I think everyone has known it for a while, and I'm, I fully expect a rule change to come uh, for catches this off season. Yeah, I would agree. I think that the Clement touchdown, in my opinion, I think that was incomplete. I think that um, the ball moved, and so it should have been incomplete. But I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. I think that the Patriots have gotten calls, um, not a conspiracy theory, just calls breaking their way in certain games and along th- you know the season. And so for this to happen in the biggest game, you don't want it to – be picking apart these calls but you know if it breaks Philly's way for once I'm cool with that I'm glad the Eagles got a Super Bowl um Josh what do you think of Nick Foles uh I certainly didn't expect you know 373 yards three touchdowns um 
you know, Nick Foles outduels Brady, takes home the Super Bowl MVP. Did you ever see this coming out of Nick Foles, Josh? Yeah. <laughs> you did? Yeah, but it was, it was sure cool to see. Yeah. Not even the starting quarterback. Yeah. It's supposed to be what comes in and is yeah, Super Bowl MVP. I don't know how if that's happened before. Yeah, what a moment for Foles. Earlier in the season. Yeah. Yeah, look, he's a 373, three touchdowns, a receiving touchdown. Yeah, it's incredible. My goodness. Yeah, it was awesome to see. And against the Patriots. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was a commercialist, Danny DeVito, in it. <laughs> well, Stoyo, let me get let me get your opinion, Stoyo. You picked the Eagles, and you had a lot more confidence going into this game. Um, I didn't trust Nick Foles. I thought that the Vikings game was an illusion or just one of those games. I didn't trust Nick Foles on the biggest stage battling Brady and you obviously didn't you picked the Eagles what did you see what led you to pick the Eagles over the Patriots I'm obviously a genius that's all I gotta say is that why you picked Philly in the uh, NFC championship I'm joking <laughs> um, um, what I saw is basically that Nick Foles lit up one of the best defenses in football at home which yeah yeah, to play it in Philly, but that was the number one defense. I thought he was going to get embarrassed by the defense, and he lit him up like no one else has this entire year. Also, he beat the Falcons, who were pretty hot coming into that game, and I just did not believe the New England Patriots defense one bit. They kind of had an easy road to the Super Bowl. They were fortunate that Jacksonville had a career day against um, the Steelers. And, yeah, that New England defense got embarrassed a couple times in the regular season. The Panthers did a pretty good number on them. And looking back at the Pittsburgh Steelers game, when they had the game won, he ended up allowing, uh, I don't know what it was, like a 60-yard, 70-yard uh, screen pass to uh, Juju Smith. Yeah. So when it comes down to it, and crunch time, that defense just couldn't hold up. And if Nick Foles could have done that against one of the best defense in football, why couldn't he do that against an average defense? I don't know. I just couldn't buy into it. I thought maybe the pressure of the moment. I clearly underestimated Nick Foles. I remember week 16, week 17 saying that the Eagles will probably go one and out, make the playoffs and get beat the first game. And uh, I ended up picking Atlanta or picking Philly against Atlanta because they were underdogs. And I should have rode with it. That underdog thing obviously seemed to work. Gavin, what did you think of Nick Foles? I mean, I'm sure you didn't see this coming. You were much more in the New England camp on this game than you know, along with me. Yeah, I, uh, I definitely didn't see this coming. Um, I, 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 saw, I got more out of Foles from this game than I expected, but uh, even more so, if you had told me that Foles would throw for 373 and three touchdowns and a pick, and Brady would throw for 505 and three touchdowns and zero picks... And then you asked me who won that game. There would be no contest. You know, yeah. Brady for sure would would win that game. But um, the Foles had an advantage over Brady in this game with a, a much stronger running attack um, and facing a much weaker rush defense, which allowed his running game to um, convert some some shorter yardage and even some longer yardage situations that um, the New England was not able to do versus. Uh, Tilly's very strong run defense. Um, no, Foles made some great throws. That throw to 
Clement was an amazing throw over two defenders right in the spot, right into the bread basket for Clement to get that touchdown. Um, a great throw. Um, the man definitely deserves to be playing somewhere else next season because they're not going to replace him for Wentz for sure. But he, he's, I think he's earned himself quite a bit of money uh, this offseason. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I feel like maybe I should have seen this coming, but you know, I can't say anything negative about Nick Foles. Those, some of those passes he made were perfect. Were right on the spot and almost indefensible. And so it's crazy to see. I'm happy for Nick Foles, and uh, yeah, he should get, he should definitely get paid. Um, I mean, uh, along with them, Patriots quarterback Tom Brady looked unstoppable in his own right for most of this game. Um. He threw for a playoff record, 505 yards and three touchdowns, most yards in a playoff game. Um, Josh, would you care to guess who Tom Brady passed? Mm. Who do you think? Kurt Warner. Kurt Warner. Can what, I guess? Uh, Gavin, what do you, who do you think? Um... I'd go with Drew Brees. What do you think, Style? He passed himself. Nope. He passed Bernie Kosar, the Cleveland Browns quarterback. Who wow. <laughs> <laughs> had thrown for 489. And I believe wow. it, I think it was 80, 87 he threw that. Is this the Super Bowl or just a playoff game? Playoffs. This is a playoff oh, record. I you meant the Super Bowl. Oh, no, my bad. Um... The only Brady had 467 against uh, the Falcons. Wow. The only asterisk uh, would be with just over two minutes to go in this game and down five, Eagles defensive end Brandon Graham commits a Michigan on Michigan crime with a forced fumble sack (laughs) on Tom Brady, resulting in an Eagles Derek Barnett recovery. The only sack of the game was that Brandon Graham play. Um. The Patriots would get the ball back down eight with 58 seconds remaining, but would fall short on a Hail Mary attempt. Um, Josh, what do you think of the end of this game? I think most of us thought Brady was just going to march down and get the game-winning score there. Oh, yeah, for sure. You could hear him on commentary. and yeah, We've all seen Tom Brady do that so many times. So, so. Well, kind of like when, when they lost to the Giants before, same thing, just like, oh yeah, they're, they're down and time's running out, but he'll, like, <laughs> he'll score and get the win, but yeah. not time, Tom. Yeah, that was a hell of a play by Brandon Graham. Um, Gavin, what did you think there late with those final two possessions? Yeah, I'm right along with Josh there. Two and a half minutes left um, and a timeout. I was like, oh, okay, I've seen this before. So they, they're they down by five? Oh, okay, no problem. They don't even have to – they can miss that extra point that goskowski has been missing all night. <laughs> they can still, still beat them. Yeah. And um, it's, it's amazing. All the talk going into the game was uh, about the, the defensive front for the Philly and how they got seven guys they can rotate in and out and how they're going to pressure Brady – And like you said, that was the first sack they had all night. Uh, That was the first turnover that they had forced all night. Um, And it was it was the most important one that they could have had because it kept the ball out of Brady's hands. And they did it early enough in the drive that they had a good enough field position to uh, kick that field goal and put them up to eight. Um, But it was uh, definitely unexpected and uh, really deflating for uh, Patriot fans. Um, but to the Hail Mary, I do want to point out, for those that say that New England gets all the calls, there was uh, two pretty blatant calls on that Hail Mary that should have been called, in my opinion, and would have gotten called any other game that were not called. Malcolm Jenkins laid out Chris Hogan about 15 <laughs> yards past the line of scrimmage, yeah. um, which is a blatant defensive interference call. And Fletcher Cox hit Brady well after the throw, not know uh, two seconds after but as far as roughing the passer goes it was definitely known that Brady had let go of the ball before Fletcher Cox took off for him and neither of those were called and the game was you know was finished with that play um so for all those 
patriot conspiracy theory people. I'd, I'd like to hear your answer for that. I, I guess Brady is not Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have lost my mind if they had called a flag on that. On that last play, I would have lost it. I, I think that you could give the Patriots, you know, those at least one of those touchdowns. You could say that that could be taken back, but I think that the NFL does a good job of. And you got nine seconds to left. Left, you're not, you know, you're throwing up a hail mary. There's a reason it's called a hail mary, and they, the refs always let you know anything go. They, you throw up the ball and they let the players decide. So, what do you think of that? Uh, Hold on. Really quick, I want to jump in. Okay. In rebuttal. Yeah. I want to disagree with you there. Okay. I agree that once the ball, like down there in the end zone, when there's a scrum to who's going to get the ball, there's pass, you know, by the letter of the law, pass interference and holding and all that all the time down there in the end zone. And I've got no beef with borderline anything going on down there. But when you take a guy out before he even gets a chance to try and make a play, and then the, uh, um, that one especially, I guess the whole QB uh, roughing the quarterback, I still disagree with that one. I think that that's, um, that shouldn't be happening. But I think what you're talking about and the two things that I brought up don't fit, uh, they don't fit the same description. I, I did see the Malcolm Jenkins take him out, and that was pretty like, what are you doing there? Like, I'm glad it wasn't called, but that was a that could have been called easily. I'll agree with that. Um, uh, you also have to challenge the refs to make that call at the last play of the game. Reggie Miller used to be great at that. Challenge the ref, make them make that crazy call. He did that to Jordan. Gronk so, did that earlier in the game too. Yeah, it is not that easy to blow a whistle on the last play of the Super Bowl. I do agree; those were definitely flags, but I do not want to be the ref that has to throw those. Oh no, I'm not jealous of that guy, but I'm all, I am jealous of the paycheck he's getting, and I feel like that guy needs to do his job in situations uh, where flags do need to be called. Because if they if they're gonna let stuff like that go, um, that has nothing to do with the end of the play. I mean, Flaxter Cox didn't need to hit Brady at all. When him hitting had no effect on the play whatsoever. But it's you know if they're trying to protect their quarterbacks, they need to be calling that. And if they want those plays to play out and be as epic as they can be, they can't be letting defenders just take wide receivers out before they can even get a chance to get down the field. <laughs> um, that's, that's my grief yeah. with those. Yeah, uh, I agree. I'm cool with it. I'll say this. We'll we'll take this game, the some, some officiating calls in this game, and we'll take the tuck rule and they'll wash each other out. All right. <laughs> 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 okay, um, the... Uh, Eagles running back LeGarrette Blunt would lead the way in rushing versus his former team, uh, running for 90 yards and a touchdown. Philly would also get great con- contributions from the receiving end, from guys like Corey Clement, caught uh, four balls for 100 yards and a touchdown. Nelson Aguilar, nine catches, 84. Uh, Alshon Jeffrey caught three for 73 and a touchdown. And uh, tight end Zach Ertz caught seven for 67 and a touchdown. So I know you were impressed with your boy Alshon Jeffrey in this game. I was, and then he uh, had a drop catch kind of that led to an interception. Yeah. So I feel like he could have done a better job there. That would have been a huge play for Philly. That, uh, that touchdown earlier, though, was nasty. Indefensible. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Alshon predicted that. He was going to win the Super Bowl this season. He was right. <laughs> Unfortunately, he didn't specify which team, so it was not the Bears. Oh, yeah. But, but, yeah, I'm just kind of shocked. If you look at the stats, Brady had 500-plus yards. He had three receivers that had over 100 yards catching. They didn't even punt a single time. And yet to lost the game. Well, I'm going to get to that now. Here's my... Um, well, first of all, Gavin, what do you think of the Eagles receiving core? Do you think that the Patriots should have done a better job against uh, Nick Foles? Yeah, I mean, they, I mean, they've struggled all year to, to get to the quarterback. Um, but they're, I expected their secondary to be a little bit better. Um, they have 
uh, two solid corners and uh, a one great safety that I thought would be able to uh, shut down Ertz a little bit more. But um, to see Aguilar especially, like he made all sorts of catches that moved chains for them. Um, he didn't score, but I think he was uh, very a very critical part of them being able to move the ball like they did. Um, I did expect more from their uh, from their defense, but I guess when you can't get to the quarterback, um, just about anybody can make can you know, make some good throws. Yeah. Um. So then we go to the Patriots. Um. Their key contribution contributions came from Danny Amendola. Eight catches, 152 yards. Chris Hogan had six for 128 and a touchdown. And Rob Gronkowski catches nine for 116 yards and two touchdowns. I think a major part of why the Patriots couldn't get it done was losing wide receiver Brandon Cooks early in the second with a head injury. That takes away a major weapon of Brady's. And then, um, you know... Some other decisions, some coaching decisions that I didn't agree with. After the game, Gronk talks about his NFL future. Says, quote, I'm definitely going to look at my future for sure. I'm going to sit down the next couple of weeks and see where I'm at. Um, Josh, what did you think um, was the biggest reason why the Patriots couldn't get it done? Yeah, I mean, I was surprised about the defense or lack thereof of both teams. Yeah, I didn't think uh, Nick Foles was going to be able to burn the Patriots defense like that. And then the Eagles defense, they were like the first defense since the 02 Buccaneers to come into the Super Bowl uh, averaging like allowing less than 10 points a game in their playoff games. Yeah. And then they gave up 33. Yeah. They gave up 41. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. I didn't expect that. Um, Gavin, do you think, do you take Gronk seriously talking about retirement, or do you think that it's just, I just lost in the Super Bowl, I'm not feeling it, you know, give me a couple, give me a couple months and I'll be back. Is that what you're thinking here? I mean, I'm guessing that he'll be back, but I have no doubt that he will, you know, be considering it at least, you know, for five seconds. Um, you know, with more and more research that's coming out about um, what it is that's really causing the, uh, you know, the the brain trauma and the CTE, uh, I think it's something that more and more players who take big hits and Gronk being a big guy, um, he, you know, people are unloading on him a bit more than you might see your average guy. I mean, he already got a concussion, you know, in the championship game. So he's, uh, I'm not sure what his total number is up to, but it's something that I think every NFL player should at least be considering and just weighing in whether it's worth it to them or not. Um, I, I don't see him retiring, especially if, uh, you know, Belichick and Brady stick around, but um, I think that it's something he'll at least consider. But if I had to, pick one or the other I'd say we see him again next year yeah yeah I think so um every year we get these guys at the end of the season and they uh express doubts and talk about you know what a grind it is they might be considering hanging it up but most of the time they end up coming back and I hope that Gronk does um we all enjoy watching them play Stoyal um I didn't understand this the Patriots starting corner Malcolm Butler was a D uh did not play, um, did not start at least, did not play on defense um, in the Super Bowl and was visibly upset during the National Anthem, having just found out that he would not play. Um, after the game, Butler said, they gave up on me, fuck it, it is what it is. Um, Stoyle, why do you think, what do you think uh, led to Malcolm Butler not being out there? Something happened internally. And uh, Belichick decided the best thing for the team was to have him sit. And I kind of agree with it. But you're talking about, this is a, a former Super Bowl hero. This is a guy who, uh, I believe, played in 16 games this year. 
and was a key part to the Patriots getting better on defense. Gavin, do you understand this? Uh, I can understand a player getting in trouble and maybe not starting, but to miss the entire Super Bowl, that's got to be something pretty crazy. Yeah, um, Eric Rowe, the cornerback that replaced him, uh, he said that he only found out right before the game started that he was going to be starting at corner, um, which he, he wasn't the starting corner during prep, um, you know, in warm-ups, in practices leading up to the Super Bowl. So it seems like a very... A recent decision that was made very last minute and so I think that you know there's a lot of communication involved in playing defense and having someone suddenly having to start in place of the guy that played 98 percent of your defensive snaps throughout the season um, that's a pretty big change to make um, I'm, I know that um, Butler had had flu-like symptoms or an illness leading up to the game um, I'm not sure how how much that affected it, and whether um, Belichick thought that he would need to, um, you know, he would be too sick to be able to truly contribute. Rather put out a healthy player uh, rather than a sick one that can only give you, you know, 50, 60, whatever percent. Um, so I'm not sure what exactly that was. I, I was, I would say we might find out later, but it's Belichick, so we'll never find out. Um, but. Yeah, that was really confusing, and I was wondering. I hadn't realized that Butler had been benched um, initially, and so when I kept seeing Rowe getting burned, I was wondering, like, why is this guy covering Jeffrey? Why is this guy, you know, on Aguilar? And come to find out, it's because you know Butler, their you know, could be their number one guy, depending on who you ask, um, wasn't playing, wasn't in the game. Yeah, I don't understand this. I think that it was poorly planned, if anything at all. I mean, if if you know that you're going to discipline a player and he's not going to play, you want to give them as much of a heads up as possible. I believe one of the reasons that I, uh, was said was that he had a poor week of practice, which I had heard with you, Gavin, that he had had the flu. So if he's sick, um, you know, that shouldn't warrant missing a Super Bowl. And uh, I would think that having... Butler on the field could help cut that 41 down to like 30 and maybe the Patriots could get a win. I think that with those receivers, with Algalar, with Torrey Smith, with Alshon Jeffrey, Butler very much could have been needed and could be a major reason why they lost this game. Um, Josh. Um, I, I agree with that. Well, okay, what do you say? Is Malcolm Butler that good? Yeah, three years ago, he had a miracle play in the Super Bowl. But this season, Pro Football Focus ranked him as the 51st QB. So, I don't know if he was that good this season. He had an off season. He had way less uh, pass defected, uh, defended that he had last year. He was on the one-year prove-it deal with New England. And Belichick benched him week two because he was getting burned. Against the Titans in the playoffs, he got beat for a touchdown, and if I recall correctly, he was beaten twice against the Jacks. All right, but I'm just saying I would rather have him on the field than on the sideline if, you know, um, I would take him. And I think that he's a, you know, Josh, what do you think? If you're a coach of a team and you got – you know, a former Super Bowl hero, this is the biggest game of the year. You got a guy sitting there who's been a starter all year going up against those weapons in Philly. I would think I'd want that corner on the field. What do you think, Josh? Yeah, and especially with uh, yeah, the team continuity in that. And uh, I would, yeah, I got changed right before the game. Yeah. And, uh, he was, I think they said, uh, played uh, 97% of the defensive snaps during... Yeah, that's during insane. Talk season. about continuity. And then he sent a couple special teams plays in the Super Bowl, and it's, yeah, asking someone it's, they didn't think he was going to be starting until right before the game it's in the on the grandest stage of them all. Yeah. If... If he got into something and he it was warranted that he wasn't supposed to play, 
I would have liked to have seen it before the national anthem. You know, and I'm sure the Patriots would too to uh, be a little more prepared for Nick Foles and company. Um, I think uh, also possibly Belichick took a gamble because the receivers were preparing for him and then he threw someone else at them. Kind of reminds me of Nick Saban switching the QB in the national college championship game. It's just one of those gambles that did not work out. For me, I have a hard time questioning Bill Belichick, the best coach of all time in NFL history. Well, but I'll say this. You said earlier that we might not uh, know what the actual truth of what happens here. I think that it will come out. I think it needs to come out. They need to figure it out because whoever this is on, this could be this is a major problem, whether it's on the player doing something to get yourself kicked off the field for the Super Bowl and hurting well, your he's teammates. Not he's not gonna be on that team. Yeah, but what team? What team's going to be like what team's going to be like, "Hey, I want that guy on my team. If we're going to make a Super Bowl run, you know, he's going to do something." Or what if uh, Belichick sabotaged him? I mean, Gavin, do you understand this? I think it has to be figured out what happened here. Yeah, I think that you know, that for I mean, everyone, especially on the New England fans, are going to want some sort of closure on this. And I think you're right. People that are looking to sign him in this offseason are going to wonder what it was. You know, if he if he got benched during a game and then also was benched for the entire Super Bowl for, um, I believe you said he was the 51st cornerback, Stoyo. Eric Rowe is the 98th cornerback. So you're talking about someone that, you know, according to these statistics, is twice as bad as him, is getting put out against uh, a team that has good receivers and being thrown out there last minute. And there has to be some reason for it, unless it's Belichick just getting a little senile (laughs) and just getting a little too clever for his own good. Um, People are going to be asking about this for, for a while now. Um, the only thing to me that even could possibly make sense is that Belichick is trying to screw over Robert Kraft for getting rid of Garoppolo and put in Eric Rowe, a former Eagle, to lose the game for the Patriots so that the Eagles could win. That's honestly the thing that makes the most logical sense to me at this point, as crazy as that is. See, I like the... Yeah, that passed through my mind, but I cannot believe someone would just blow a Super Bowl. I, I, like, I like the way you're thinking, Gavin. This is the kind of stuff I can talk about right here. Um, I get into. I mean, as bad as he is as Kraft, it's the most important for Belichick to win. So you're talking, you're talking about a a coach throwing a Super Bowl. Ask Tim Brown about that. He'll have plenty to say about uh, Bill Callahan and those and that Raiders team. You remember that, Josh? Oh yeah. That was crazy. Wasn't that you? Wasn't that your team, Josh? Weren't you a big uh, Raiders guy back then? No. <laughs> I, was, I was never a quote-unquote quote, <laughs> for all those players. Yeah. Big Raiders fan. Well, all right, here's the... Uh, I was uh, rooting for the Buccaneers in that game. Yeah, I think I was too. Um, Patriots head coach Bill Belichick on benching. Uh, Malcolm Butler, he said, quote, I have respect for Malcolm's competitiveness. I'm sure he felt like he could have helped. In the end, we have to make the decisions that are best for the football team. That's really all I can say about that. And he also said in a different interview that it wasn't player discipline related. So I'm really interested to hear what what the truth is here, what really happened, because it doesn't make any... Every time they ask somebody why, they give some like they. It's uh, like robot, pre robotic. Yeah. Answer. Yeah. Like, yeah, but that's what they do all the time. It's that's, not like something new. Like Belichick does not like to give any information to the media. Yeah, that's the Patriot way, is what you're saying. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. Um. Gavin, you have to be feeling confident now. The Lions officially name Patriots DC Matt Patricia to the to head coach. Um, Patricia had anything to do with that Malcolm Butler benching? They can just fire him right now. <laughs> if he 
Vince hits Darius Slay for any reason, I'm going to fly out of Detroit and shave his beard off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I was, I'd been warming up to the idea of Patricia as the head coach. Um, this game certainly didn't keep that warming up continuation. Um, good grammar there, Gavin. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, it's, it, what's done is done. There's nothing else to do but hope that uh, a guy who is a really smart dude, um, he's got a, a PhD in, or a degree in aeronautical physics, so he's not, he's not an idiot. But um, like I said uh, in a podcast a few weeks ago, I think being a head coach not only takes someone that knows the game, but also takes a leader, you need to be a leader of men. Yeah. Um, and that'll be the real deciding factor, I think, for whether he ends up being a good head coach or not. Speaking of being a leader, uh, Josh, if you were a Colts fan, would you? how would you feel about Josh McDaniels, who is most likely going to be the head coach in Indy? Hmm. I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, they have Andrew Luck. I don't uh, want to be confident. Just, uh, I don't have a lot of, uh, I don't know, the typically like Bill Belichick's underlings when they leave him aren't always the best. Yeah, that's exactly Gavin's worry. Like Charlie Weiss and Romeo Grinnell and yeah. Yada and Josh McDaniels and like he's, oh. he's a he's a Belichick guy. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah. like yeah we seen it before the both coordinators look good. Well, they looked good uh, at least the other day. Yeah. The uh, the Raiders released corner David Amerson, who was due $5.5 million in 2018. This is John Gruden's first roster move as a Raiders head coach. Um, Amerson was injury hit last season, missed the final nine games with a foot injury. So we see Gruden already starting, shaping up the team. Um, this podcast is this episode is going to wrap up the 2017 season. So, what would you make of this season? Quite a year, huh? Quite a year. If you'd have told me a year ago that Nick Foles was going to be the Super Bowl MVP, <laughs> I would have not believed you. But his run reminded me kind of of the Joe Flacco run that he had a few years ago to win the Super Bowl. Yeah. Nick Foles in the postseason. Uh, completed 73% of his passes for 115.7 QB rating. Wow. So that is an impressive run. So you think next year we'll be talking about the Bears at this time? Uh, I talk about the Bears constantly. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I sure hope we'll make it to the playoffs. Yeah, it'll be nice to see. Gavin... Um, so you said you predicted the Eagles were going to lose their star quarterback and win the whole thing, right? Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, we got that <laughs> on record, right? Yep. <laughs> um, what do you think? Uh, what do you think is going to be the biggest changes going into next year? you think they're going to get the catch rule figured out? I mean, as far as the NFL uh, is concerned, I think the catch rule is going to be one of the biggest things. Um, but one of the, this actually looks to be a pretty exciting off season with um, with Foles riding on his own coattails uh, to a new contract, I'm sure, and also with the uh, the trade to, of Alex Smith to Washington, we see a new quarterback starting in Washington. We see a new quarterback starting in Kansas City uh, with Mahomes, and then we will also see Kirk Cousins going somewhere else. So um, yeah. you don't often see that many starting quarterbacks changing um, with people that at least potentially look like they could be legitimate starters. Um, so it should be an exciting off season to see where um, Foles and Cousins end up. And um, it'll be also exciting to see what happens with the, the Patriots and their, uh, the leaders of their team, what Brady does um, what Belichick does for all the people that are anti-Patriot. You all should have been, cheering for Brady this year because now that they've lost, I think the chances of him quitting and Belichick quitting have dropped significantly. So yeah. you need to rethink your anti-Patriot cheering. <laughs> just just saying. I think... Um, you think of the long term. 
I think another thing I'm interested to see is how the Vikings quarterback situation turns out. Um, being selfish, being in the NFC North, I'm interested to see what decision they make because that's going to impact our division. And uh, we'll see. I believe they'll probably try and keep Bridgewater and Keenum. Keenum's going to demand some money, though. Josh, how do you think the North is looking next year? Packers have made a lot of moves with their coaches and management. Do you expect uh, some big changes in Green Bay or pretty much the same core coming back? Josh? Yeah. You think Green Bay takes the division? Oh, yeah. I think I'll. Aaron Rodgers being healthy will be back to our normal routine of winning the division, going to the playoffs. I don't know. Bears Bears are coming for you. Thanks. I think there's some drama in uh, Green Bay. Rodgers is not happy that they fired his QB coach without consulting him. You know who that is. That's probably Danica talking to him. Well, that's true, but I'm sure uh, on the field, uh, yeah, yeah, Rodgers will still be killing it. But, uh, yeah, we need to knock that kind of stuff off because he needs to be happy because I think he's only got like two years on his contract and we're going to try to get him uh, an extension yeah. here soon. But uh, not if you're like, firing people that he likes behind his back and stuff. So. Gavin, you think this is the year Stafford takes the next step, becomes a, a MVP candidate, wins a division title? I think if he can get some help on defense, um, we've seen improvement from him um, You know, over recent years, even after Calvin Johnson left, um, we've seen him become a better and better quarterback, so I think if he can get um, some a better defense and not have to and a better running game, so that it's not relied so heavily on him, I think that would even open things up for him, and he can uh, shine a little bit more. Um, all the you know, if you want to be MVP, your team has to be a winner, and he can't be he can't be a winner if the other side of the ball won't stop won't stop the other team. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It'll be interesting to see. Stoyo, what do you think of the Bears? What's our biggest need? What do you see want what do you want to see change the most uh starting next season? I would like to get an offensive lineman. I would like some uh outside linebackers and a wide receiver. Yeah. Uh, we should not draft a wide receiver at the eighth spot. You don't want and Calvin Ridley? I- Ridley is not a top 10 pick. I like Calvin Ridley, but I also like that offensive lineman out of Notre Dame. He looks like a beast. Quentin Nelson, if he's available, should be drafted so he can reunite with his online coach from Notre Dame. But in my opinion, he's not going to be available at 8. I hope so. We need a nasty lineman. We need someone like Kreutz back running things in that line. Olin Krutz was a beast. I know you guys are glad that he's out of the league now. Uh, overrated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who's that? <laughs> 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 well, I'm sorry. We were talking uh, about NFL. We are talking about NFL, Josh. You you just blocked out those days. Those those old Brett Favre days, you just checked out. You're like, when's Aaron Rodgers starting? <laughs> but... Anyway, it should be a hell of a year. I can't wait for September already. Um, but we'll be we'll keep podcasting away. We'll do pre-draft, post-draft, all the good breaking news stuff. And uh, thanks for coming on, guys. I hope you're back with me our next time. Two hundred thirty-two days till opening day, guys. <laughs> and come see us do the XFL podcast. Hey, I'm down. Let's get uh, Tebow and Manziel dueling it out in the XFL. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>
But all right, thanks to the listeners. You guys are awesome. Keep listening. Thanks, guys. We'll be back at it next week. Peace out.